Um, okay, so what this equation right here says, it says fluctuations in entropy make entropy fluctuations. So these, these equations are a little bit trivial. That satisfies a convection equation. So in other words, going back to this equation right here, it just says, this says that if I have an entropy disturbance, it just convects with the flow, right? Um, what this equation says, it says P1S equals zero, right? That, sa that says that if you have an entropy fluctuation, it doesn't make any pressure disturbance. So if the entropy is, is not constant, if it's oscillating, the pressure won't oscillate with it, first order. This equation says that entropy fluctuations don't cause any fluid motion. The fluid doesn't move. Um, uh, and then what this equation says is that if you have an entropy fluctuation, the density does change. Right? The um, del dot uh, u is still 0, but just because of the temperature change. A, a den, uh, entropy fluctuations cause temperature changes, and therefore uh, they, they cause temper isobaric temperature changes. The temperature oscillates at constant pressure, so therefore the density has got to oscillate. All right. Um, so entropy oscillations do not excite velocity. They don't excite vorticity. They don't excite pressure, or they don't excite vort uh, dilatational disturbances. But they do cause the density and the temperature to oscillate. Okay. So here's a lot of words, but let's start. Let's just talk about this a little bit. What, what this means, because this is really important stuff. First of all, in a homogeneous uniform flow. So. Be, be very clear that this is a this is a major assumption, and this is what I'm making to make these arguments, and then I'm going to add, I'm going to take this away in a minute. But if I have a homogeneous flow that's that's spatially uniform, I have these three disturbance modes, and they're propagating completely independently. So what do I mean by independently? That means if I have an entropy fluctuation, it doesn't do anything to the vorticity. If I have a dilatational acoustic disturbance, it has no effect on the vorticity. They're just ships passing in the night. They're just doing their thing, and everybody else is doing their thing. And my total velocity, so my velocity field is a superposition of vortical and acoustic disturbances. But those fundamental canonical modes are just doing whatever they want to do, and they don't care what the other modes are doing. The acoustic mode could care less what vorticity is doing. Vorticity couldn't care what the acoustics is doing. They're propagating completely independently. All right? In the linear approximation, that's another thing. OK. So, as a, so this, this bullet here says what I just said as well. The three modes are decoupled within the approximations of this analysis. And I want to emphasize key assumptions are homogeneous and linear. As soon as I take that away, this whole this goes away. And I'll just give me one second here. So in other words, vortical, entropy, and acoustically induced fluctuations are totally independent. Yes, sir? Uh, what do you exactly mean by homogeneous? Homogeneous means I mean that the... the, the uh, but, but, OK, I mean that the variables with the subscript not are not functions of space. So no spatial dependence of the time average quantity. So the mean density is spatially constant. Mean flow, constant. No shear, no acceleration of the mean flow. It's just constant. Anyone else have a question? OK, then finally what this says is that there's no sources or sinks in these disturbance modes. All of these modes have zero on the right-hand side. So if I have a vorticity disturbance, what that equation says is that vorticity disturbance just moves with constant amplitude, all right? But it doesn't change its amplitude. Um, so they propagate with constant amplitude. The same thing with the wave equation. No sources or sinks, all right? So that's what that says about, that's kind of my baseline. Those, that's the, the key things I want you to see. Um, Another point here is let's talk about length and, and, and velocity scales. Acoustic disturbances propagate at the sound speed, so those are zipping along really fast, whereas vortical and entropy disturbances are moving at the bulk flow velocity. And this has an important implication because acoustic properties vary over an acoustic length scale. I'll call that lambda sub lambda, I guess, C over F. Okay, the speed of sound divided by frequency is the acoustic wavelength. But if I have an entropy or vortical disturbance oscillating at the same frequency, its length scale, the length scale over which that fluctuation occurs, is going to be much shorter. It's going to scale as u naught over f. And so the, the wavelength, I put that in quotes, but if I have a vortical disturbance, um, if I have this convecting train of vortices which are oscillating at some frequency, the distance between those is going to be shorter than the acoustic wavelength by a factor equal to the mean flow Mach number. All right. So, and, and, and oftentimes we'll make an assumption about disturbances, we'll say they're compact, which means that that if a disturbance is small relative to, let's say, the length of a plane or something like that. Oftentimes, you can say that acoustic disturb 
that flames are acoustically compact. Often, for many real applications, the flame is small relative to the wavelength. The acoustic wavelength is very large. But you can't say that about the size of the flame relative to an entropy or vortical disturbance, because the entropy and vortical disturbance oscillates over such a shorter length scale that that flame is not compact. That has a lot of implications for flame response dynamics, flame dynamics. OK. The other thing about it is that acoustic disturbances, being true waves, do all the things that waves do. They don't require convection, right? I can, energy and information is propagated without convection, right? I don't have to physically walk up to you for you to hear me. Um, sound is just going, going along. It doesn't, you don't have to have mass transport to have energy transport. Uh, the other thing about acoustic waves is they bounce, right? Vortical disturbances don't bounce. Entropy disturbances don't bounce. When I talk, that sound hits that wall, it bounces off of it. Again, big implications, because what happens is, is that sound, so sound, once it's generated in a combustor, can become trapped, so to speak, inside the combustor. It just keeps bouncing off across all the walls. You might say, well, what about the inflow and the outflows? It turns out that the inflows and the outflows are really good, uh, are good re reflectors for acoustic waves. That most of the energy actually reflects back off of the nozzle or the combustor outlet. Um, the other thing that happens, sound has this really interesting property is that it diffracts. So what does diffraction mean? It means that you could all go sit out in the hall, sit around the corner, and you could still hear me, right? The sound bends around obstacles. Vortical and entropy disturbances don't diffract. They only go where the flow goes. Um, so this has lots of interesting applications. Um, so for example, this, this is an example of this diffraction point. In an annular combustion chamber, so the combustion chamber looks like an annulus. Let me draw a picture just to make sure you all know what I'm talking about. So like an aircraft engine combustor or some ground power combustors, the combustion chamber is basically a ring of fire. The flow is coming out at you. All right? And you'll have instabilities which are spinning around. All right? You'll get these acoustic waves just zipping around. All right? And so they cause flow, fluid motions in the azimuthal direction. Okay, let me turn this picture sideways now. So here's that annulus sideways. And now what you have are these nozzles. In fact, we can draw them all. We can draw a bunch. The reactants are coming out of these nozzles, coming out of the compressor, all right? So here's those nozzles. The flow, the acoustic wave is oscillating around this way, but because of diffraction, sound waves wrap around and they go into the nozzle and they can actually cause very strong axial fluctuations in the flow as well. And so that's actually what this, this data is showing. This is, this is taken, data taken during a, a, in a combustor. You have acoustic waves going this way. If you look here, you'll see these strong flow oscillations um, coming out of the injector. So, um, Okay, the other thing about this is that we, as I, okay, so let me give you an example of, of how this is really helpful to understand real data. Acoustic and vortical disturbances don't propagate at the same speed, all right, as I, as I just mentioned. So let's suppose that I have two disturbances with different phase speeds. So the total velocity, this is what I, I measure. I can't measure, really measure these individual contributions. These are, these are kind of my, I'm, I'm creating this, this theory to help you understand um, the, real, the, the real measurable, the measured quantity. But let's just hypothesize that if I go into a combustor, I make a PIV measurement, that what I'm measuring is actually a superposition of an acoustic fluctuate, flow fluctuation and a vortical flow fluctuation. All right? And just a simple model, let's assume that I have an acoustic wave that's propagating, that's oscillating harmonically, cosine omega t, and it's, this is what we call a plane wave. It's moving at the speed of sound. All right? The vortical disturbance is moving with the mean flow velocity. So what happens if I add these two up? Well, in, in A, these A denotes the magnitude of these two disturbances. If I, this is the amplitude of the acoustic wave. This is the amplitude of the vortical disturbance. So just for simplicity, if I assume that these two disturbances are the same magnitude, if I add them up, you can use some trig identities and get this. And what you see is this is a term that's oscillating harmonically and just moving along at some velocity. But this term right here doesn't change in time. What this says is that the amplitude has this spatial modulation field. All right? And what's happening is, is that these acoustic waves in some locations, cause fluctuations that are in phase with the vorticity disturbance, in other cases, out of phase. And so what you'd see is you'll see a modulation in amplitude. And this is, in fact, what we exactly see in real combustors. What I'm this is data. I'm plotting the magnitude of the velocity fluctuations as a function of spatial location. And this is that plot. Now notice this is a plot in space, not in time. 
And what it shows is at this point, I have the flow is really oscillating a lot. It's just really flopping around, sloshing around. At this location, it's barely oscillating at all. Well, if I have purely an acoustic plane wave, I would have oscillations in time, but no oscillations in space. I would get this. If I had purely a vortical disturbance, I would get only that. But if I add the two up, this is this is what I would get. You can see it's a pretty good fit to the data. So this is this is this is these are very very typical of what you see in unsteady combustion, unstable combustors. You see these spatial uh, patterns during combustion instabilities. Okay. Now I want to move on to the to the question about modal coupling processes. So I've made a lot of important assumptions here. And what I've really talked about then is, suppose I've said that there's no sources or sinks, and once you have these disturbances, I've told you how they propagate. But you might wonder, well, where do they come from in the first place? And where they come from in the first place comes from when you start neglecting all the stuff that I said in the neglect. As soon as you have an inhomogeneous flow, you create source terms. As soon as you have nonlinearities, you have source terms. All right? Um, and so there's a couple ways in which these modes start to, that you both create disturbances as well as causing them to interact with each other. For example, as soon as a sound wave impinges on a boundary, it creates vorticity and entropy. All right? So when I'm talking, it might be hard for you to visualize, but as soon as sound hits the wall at an angle, it actually creates a vortical disturbance at the wall. And what's happening is, is you have a no-slip boundary condition at the wall, sound wave comes zinging in, and it wants to cause a tangential flow fluctuation at the wall. But you got a no-slip condition at the wall. That no-slip condition, the only way you can satisfy that is to create a vortical disturbance. So it's a source of damping in, 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 in pipes, is, is that, that uh, acoustic damping, is that sound waves, when they impinge on walls, some of the energy in the sound wave gets transferred into a vortical disturbance. And, and that's actually important, because what happens to the vortical disturbance? Well, it just convex out. System. If I got a combustor, remember the sound waves kind of get trapped, they're bouncing around inside there. But the energy, if some of it can get pumped into a vortical disturbance or an entropy disturbance, that the flow will then carry it out of the system. Um, and that's a source of damping. Um, the other thing is regions of flow in homogeneity. So as soon as you have a shear flow, a flow with a velocity gradient, a sound wave propagating through a shear flow makes vorticity. All right? um, an accelerating entropy disturbance generates an acoustic wave. So as soon as you take a fluctuation in entropy and you accelerate it, it actually makes a sound. It makes a sound. Um, and then the other, other effect is nonlinearity. So as soon as you drop the assumption of small disturbance amplitude, um, you get sources. So for example, i would given this example before. Um, if you have large amplitude vertical disturbances, so turbulence actually makes sound, right? The shop air experiment that I told you. But in order to understand that, you can't use linear theory to understand the sound source term. The sound source term is an intrinsically nonlinear term. OK. That is all I'm going to say about canonical modes. Does anyone have any questions about that? OK, so I took such pains to be crystal clear that I've just totally blown my schedule. So we're just going to, not going to talk about disturbance energy at all. Too bad. Um, well, I, I, actually, I can't totally skip this, but these disturbances have energy. All right, they, they, that energy, there's, there's fluctuations in energy, and, uh, and they're, they're carrying. Um, I do have to talk about one, I do have to say one thing, otherwise you won't understand a lot of what we're going to talk about next. If you, you can write an acoustic energy equation, an equation for the energy in the acoustic field, and it looks like this. All right? This, this equation right here. So time rate of change of energy. This is, energy, this is kinetic energy due to the fluctuations. This is potential energy due to um, volumetric disturbances. This term is a convection. This says you have energy flux. The main point I want to get to is this right-hand side. This is a source term. So if this right-hand side was zero, we would say that I have no source terms. Acoustic waves are just doing whatever they're doing. Q dot prime, or Q dot one, denotes fluctuations in heat release. All right? Fluctuations in heat release, I've already told you, make sound. And that's what this term is telling you. And more specifically, what it tells you is, is that when a fluctuation in heat release multiplied by the fluctuation in pressure is non-zero, that that acts as a sound source term. A, a sound, a sound um, it, it, it acts as a source term to acoustic energy. If I make a fluctuation in heat release, I can actually pump energy into the acoustic field if, if the product of the unsteady heat release and unsteady pressure is greater than zero. What this also says is unsteady heat release can pull energy out of a sound field. 
if this product is negative. And it can be negative, as I'll show you in a minute. Okay, well let's talk about what this product means for a minute if you have harmonic disturbances. Um, so the time average of the product of, of two fluctuating quantities, it depends on the phase between the two quantities. So for example, if I have sine omega t times sine omega t plus a phase shift, if I take the time average, that time average is equal to one half cosine of the phase shift. All right? So if I plot this time average as a function of phase shift, notice that if the phase shift is zero, I get the half. Okay? Or if it's 180, I get minus a half. All right? So in other words, what this says is that if the fluctuating pressure and the fluctuating heat release are in phase, this source term is positive when I'm making acoustic energy. All right? It also says that if those two terms are out of phase, the unsteady heat release is actually sucking energy out of the acoustic field. Um, and it says that, that if they're 90 degrees to each other, or 270 degrees, they're oscillating orthogonally to each other, no time average flow of energy into the acoustic field. All right? And, um, this is important because we're going to call, we're going to, uh, I'm going to tell you something called Rayleigh's Criterion. Rayleigh's Criterion was a, states that unsteady heat addition adds energy to the acoustic field when the pressure and heat release oscillation, when that phase is, is, is between 90 degrees, between plus and minus 90 degrees. All right, and you can understand that from this uh, here. So if, if this term denoted the fluctuating pressure, this term the unsteady heat release, or some phase shift, that phase shift lies between 0 and 90, or 0 and minus 90, then I'm adding energy to the acoustic field. And that's, at the end of the day, where combustion instabilities come from, is that unsteady heat release is pumping energy into the acoustic field. But what it also tells you is that combustors need not be unstable everywhere in all conditions, because you can have phases where it's pulling energy out of the acoustic field. All right? Um, and so, in fact, there are conditions where combustors are quiet. So what this, to just illustrate this point, this is data taken uh, from Penn State by Professor Santavica. And they ran a combustor over a whole host of different conditions. And I'm not going to get into the, what controls this phase shift right now. Hopefully I'll have time later. But they, what they did was they just measured the unsteady pressure in their combustor, which I'm plotting on the x-axis. And then they measured, from chemiluminescence, they measured the unsteady heat release, or a marker of the unsteady heat release, and the unsteady pressure with the same microphone. And then they measure the phase shift. And notice how you get really big amplitude oscillations when this phase shift is close to zero. And as it falls off to 90 degrees, those oscillations basically go away. Right, so this, this is just an experimental demonstration of this Rayleigh's criterion. So in order to, what we're going to go toward then is, is to, in order to understand why and how instabilities develop, we really have to understand this phase shift. This phase shift between the pressure and unsteady heat release is going to control when I'm stable and when I'm unstable. Okay, again, we're just going to skip right over this stuff. Um, so now what I, I want to spend just a few more minutes talking about acoustic waves in general. Uh, and, uh, Boy, sorry, you're not going to benefit from all this wisdom in these slides, because I'm just going to have to blast through them. Um, saying that tongue in cheek, of course, but uh, <laughs> let's see. Um, <coughs> okay, one, one other point. I was just what I'm doing in these two slides is just giving you some some general overviews and differentiating between acoustic and vortical disturbances. I'm sorry. <laughs> There's one other point I need to make here. See, when you start skipping stuff. This creates all kinds of havoc. Um, I talked about coupling between acoustic and vortical disturbances. I want to spend, uh, or between disturbance modes. I want to spend one more minute talking about coupling between acoustic and vortical disturbances. That's really important. Um, it's kind of clear if you if you look at this picture, you'd say, "Wow, fluid! It kind of looks like I got vortices floating around in here, All right?" And you do. If you were to measure the vorticity, you would see blobs of vorticity. What happens is, is that when acoustic waves go propagating through regions of inhomogeneity, regions of shear, remember I told you that they generate vorticity. And so think about this flow. If there was no, more, no uh, acoustic fluctuations, I would have flow going through this nozzle in that direction. And I would have flow separation. All right? And 
Now to have this big shear layer, the shear layer roll up due to the Kelvin Helmholtz instability. The acoustic wave modulates the strength of that Kelvin Helmholtz instability. And it causes the vorticity that's, that's getting generated at that rapid expansion through that shear layer separating to get modulated in time. And so what you basically generate is puffs of vorticity which come off and then they convect downstream and you get another one. And, uh, and so you'll see this convecting train of vortices which move downstream. Now oftentimes when we excite flames acoustically, what's most evident is not the, the acoustic flow fluctuation knocking the flame around, but the vortical. So I hit the, my combustor with an acoustic wave, it makes a vortex. That vortex just makes the, turn, makes the flame do all kinds of crazy stuff. The flame might get rolled up around in the vortex and so forth. So it's that acoustic vortical coupling. So I have acoustic waves, they excite vorticity, the vorticity excites heat release, the heat release excites more acoustic waves if I satisfy Rayleigh's criterion. And that's how I close that loop, whereby I can just sit back and my combustor can oscillate in and of itself. They're self-excited oscillation. Okay. Um, Okay, there was one other point that I, that I, when I was talking about this difference between acoustic and vortical disturbances, I, am, you know, I emphasized a few things. One other thing I want to emphasize about acoustic waves is any acoustic system naturally has, uh, so because acoustic waves reflect off of boundaries, any confined system naturally has natural acoustic modes. All right, it has natural frequencies at which it'll just oscillate. All right, you don't have that for vortical entropy disturbances, and that's what I want to get into a little bit more here. Um, so let's, let's talk about the wave equation and the solutions of the wave equation. All right, so this is the wave equation without mean flow. I hope I've made you comfortable with why we can neglect it. And uh, in particular, I uh, want to think about the wave equation uh, when I have harmonic oscillations. All right, so how many of you are familiar with complex notation? OK, good. So I'm going to use complex notation because it turns out for these kinds of problems much simpler. So I'm going to write the unsteady pressure as the real part of what I'm going to call p hat, which is only a function of space, times e to the minus i omega t. All right. So p hat is a complex quantity, and the complex part is just tells you the phase. So the nice thing about using complex notation is I don't have to write two terms. I can only write one term because the phase is built into the complex part of the term. Okay. The unsteady velocity, I'm going to write the same way. And so the solutions, you can write solutions for the unsteady pressure and velocity as, as, the, um, as basically two traveling waves. The acoustic field in a one-dimensional geometry consists of a traveling wave zipping by at the speed of sound this way and zipping by in this direction at the speed of sound. And they add up. All right. um, and I apologize because I'm going to jump ahead a few more here. Um, I want to get, what I need to get to are standing waves. All right. Suppose I have two sound waves going in opposite directions with the exact same amplitude. All right. <laughs> Each wave individually, the magnitude, the amplitude of that wave doesn't change. So there's no spatial variation. If I just had a single traveling wave going in this direction and I measured the fluctuation pressure and velocity, I would see a phase difference between this pressure and velocity at each point. You could take time for the sound to propagate. But the amplitude of fluctuations would be no different at each point. As soon as I add up two disturbances propagating in opposite directions, a totally different thing happens, and that's called a standing wave. So if I, if I take the solutions that I showed you and I skip over the detail, the unsteady pressure looks like this, all right? It looks like 2 times cosine kx times cosine omega t. k is the wave number. It's, it's uh, omega over c. And what does this tell you? This tells you that this, this term is not varying in time, but it's varying in space. This term is only varying in time. And so what that tells you is at each location, the unsteady pressure is oscillating with a different magnitude. There are locations where the unsteady pressure is zero. Okay? I have these two sound waves, and they could be blowing my eardrums out. But if I were to be at a specific location, I wouldn't measure anything. There would be no fluctuation of pressure at the pressure node. All right? And now this also has a 2 times cosine kx. There are other locations where the pressure fluctuation would be huge. All right? So if you think about that Rubik, that silly Rubik's tube video I showed you, you can see that standing wave pattern on the plane, right? Where Big oscillations at some location, almost no oscillations at the other. And we call this a standing wave. So the disturbance, as opposed to the whole wave field just shifting along but not changing its amplitude, the traveling wave, the disturbance is frozen in space, just oscillating in time. You are all very familiar with standing, with, with standing waves. If I 
take a, a rope, a jump rope, and I oscillate it up and down. I, I hope you can all visualize the pattern in your head. What am I going to see? This rope is just going to oscillate up and down. Each point of that rope that I'm shaking up and down is oscillating harmonically in time. Every point is oscillating at the same frequency. But the amplitude, the displacement of that rope, is different at one location than at the other. In contrast, if you've ever tried to unsnag your hose from a stick out in your yard, what do you do? You take the hose and you go like that, right? And you create a traveling wave. So you have this oscillation, and it just goes zipping down the hose, but it's a traveling wave. It doesn't stay frozen. In, in, um, in the, the, the basic pattern that doesn't get frozen in space. Okay? Um, and that's what I've tried to draw here, is that, uh, that with standing waves, the, uh, what I'm drawing here is the fluctuating pressure in dark and the fluctuating velocity in dash as a function of space for a standing wave. And I'm drawing it at different instances of time. So you can see at this location right here, at x equals zero for this example, I have a velocity node. The flow is not moving. It is sitting still. But the pressure is oscillating in time. It's oscillating a lot. It moves from here. You go one to two to three to four to five to six to seven to eight. It's oscillating in time. Harmonically. If I come to this location, I'm at a pressure node. The pressure is not changing. But look what's happening to the flow. It's bouncing up and down. And this is another feature of standing waves. The pressure and velocity are different. One's node is the other's anti node and vice versa. Okay. Um, so because of this fact that acoustic waves reflect, you, as, as I mentioned, you get natural modes, that ducts will naturally oscillate at certain frequencies. All right? And it's not just one frequency, but it's many frequencies. Um, and so, for example, for a duct that is, has two rigid ends, if I, if I take a solid piece of pipe, I've weld both ends shut, <coughs> the natural frequencies would obey this formula. N times C over 2L. Let's just talk about that formula for a minute. Um, and then I'll, I'll let you go take a break. Um, but uh, if I take a pipe, it's rigid at both ends. The fundamental, N is an index. N can equal 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So the fundamental frequency is C over 2L. Well, where does that come from? Well, think about it. If I, have a, if I have an acoustic disturbance, for it to make a round trip, it has to go bang, bang, come back. Well, how long does it take for a sound wave to go there and back? Let's, let's write that out. So I'll call T the, the period of oscillation. That's the time for the oscillation to repeat itself. Well, how long does it take for the wave to go from here to here? Um, it takes L over C naught, where this is L. Okay? Um, and then how long does it take to come back? Uh, it takes L over C naught, right? So it's 2L over C naught is the period. The frequency is 1 over the period. It's equal to C naught over 2L. And look at that. If I set for the, the first mode, n equals one is c naught over two l. Well, it's a little harder with this with this time of transit analogy to understand higher order modes. But you also have higher modes. This this duct not only oscillates naturally at the frequency of c over two l, but also oscillates at the frequency of two times c over two l, or three times c over two l, or four times c over two l. So in this example, these these natural frequencies are integer multiples of each other. Okay, so um, with that as my crash acoustic background, we're now going to move into unsteady heat release effects, and I think we'll take a break here. So let's see, so we're supposed to break at 1015 to 1045, right? But you guys don't need a half hour. That's, that sounds like a recipe for sloth. Let's, uh, let's come back at 1035 so I can get through all my notes. Figure out the conditions under which this omega imaginary term is greater than zero. That's an instability. So I'm just, I did all the hard work for you, and I'm telling you, that when you satisfy this criterion, omega imaginary is greater than zero. All right? Okay, so what I, what, let's, let's define everything. Tau, remember, is that time delay. It's a time delay between you have some flow disturbance, you have some heat release, and they're not in phase. There's a shift, and that time delay is tau. And again, I'm going to tell you where tau comes from later today. T is the period of oscillation. So rather than writing things in terms of omega, I've, it's, it's, it's easier to think of in terms of P. T is the period of oscillation. It's one over the frequency. The subscript one quarter is means it's the period of the quarter wave mode. All right. And uh, now we have a new index. M. M is also can, can equal any of a range of, of integers. One, two, three, four, five, six. And the reason I have a, I have a new integer is because let's back up. It's because sine. This term right here, as I increase tau, the sine 
term goes positive, and then it goes negative, and then it goes positive, it oscillates. And so I get, these, I get this new index. So let's keep this in mind. We have two indices. We have M and we have N. N is not script N, but uh, whatever this N is, is mode number, quarter wave or three quarter wave. M is an index, just another index. So if we plot this up, let's if we take this formula, and now what I'm going to do is I'm going to plot. This really isn't a plot, but whatever you call this. Um, a graphical representation. The x-axis is tau over t one quarter. All right. The y, well, there's no y-axis. The And I'm demarcating these different regions into regions where oscillations are self-excited or damped. So s denotes stable, u denotes unstable. So what this tells you is that when tau over t lies between half and one, oscillations will be amplified. All right, the system will just naturally oscillate if tau happens to lie within this range, all right? Oscillate, the combustor will be quiet in this range, between 0 and 1 1 and 3 halves. Um, and again, the reason I have this index m is because this would be an instability, but I could also have an instability between 3 halves and 2, or between 5 halves and 3, or between 7 halves and 4, et cetera. This keeps oscillating up and down. Because as I'm shifting that time delay, I'm moving, I'm, I have that sine wave, and it's just shifting, I'm just shifting the pressure and heat release because of the periodic they're moving in and out of phase with each other. Um, so that's that. And so what this tells you is now tau, let's talk about this, this t over a quarter. This is basically a geometric property of your combustor. Once you know what your combustor, you know how big it is, the length, that really basically sets the natural frequency of the system. So once you size the thing, you got a pipe that's x feet long or whatever, then you pretty much know the period. And so this is telling you that what matters is what's the time delay relative to that period because that's controlling the relative phase shifts as I'm moving as that sine wave is moving in and out of phase with, with another sine wave. All right. Okay. So now let's go to those same formulas. That same formula. Let me back it up two slides, and let me look at the three-quarter wave mode. All right. So this is the next natural frequency of this duct. So I'm going to let n equals two. So then what you end up with is, is this formula. All right. So when you satisfy this criterion you'll have an instability. And uh, I've plotted that on the same graph over here. All right, so this is the three-quarter wave mode, and this is the stability of the three-quarter wave mode as a function of tau over t. And now you can see that these, uh, that, that these stable, unstable bands are oscillating three times as fast because the natural frequency is three times higher for a three-quarter wave mode as, as, as three times the frequency of the quarter wave mode. They're oscillating three times as fast, but you still get this periodic pattern. So what does this tell you? This tells you that, okay, let's go to this stable region right here. All right, the quarter wave mode is stable. But in reality, actually, in this region here and in this region here, even though the quarter wave mode is stable, actually the three quarter wave mode is going to be oscillating. All right, only in this little region, only in this relatively narrow band right between here and here is both the quarter and the three quarter wave mode stable. Um, Similarly, yeah, so, um, and so that's this mode overlap problem, is that uh, it, it just tells you how, again, how tricky this problem is because you have all these natural frequencies, and any given one of them can become uh, exciting. A, uh, another thing, I'm going to come back to this, is one of the key things that makes combustion instability such a nasty problem is the non-monotonic dependence of combustion instability boundaries on underlying parameters. So let me give you an example. NOx. Um, if I increase my flame temperature, what's going to happen to NOx? It's going to go up, right? You all feel good about that. You might not know what the answer is quantitatively, but you feel good, right? You can, you can tell me that's going to happen. If I um, make my combustor shorter and I decrease residence time and I got a cool flame, what's going to happen to CO? CO is going to go up too because it doesn't, doesn't recombine. Okay, so you, that's great, right? We can, we got good physics. We we know what's going on, um, and so we and, and there's these 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 uh, these monotonic dependencies between input and output. Combustion instabilities because of this sine omega tau. What happens is is lots of stuff. Fundamentally, um, when you, when instability boundaries are moving around, you're changing tau. So as the flame length changes, as you change fuel air ratio, you change the flame length. As you change um, Ambient temperature, the flame length is changing. As you change power level, you're changing 
you're changing flame length or where the flame is. All this stuff's changing tau. And so something that drives field operators crazy um, is, is they say, um, so when my, if, my, if I have a little bit more propane coming in my fuel, what's going to happen to my combustion stability boundaries? Or as the humidity goes up, what should happen to combustion stability? And the answer is, well, let's see. The instability amplitude could go up, or it could go down, or it could stay the same. And those are all right answers, right? And, see, and you can see that here, this, these oscillations, right? And, and because what's happening is, for example, as you increase power, is you're going up, and then you're coming, well, excuse me, this is a stable region. Turn, and this would be the stability boundary. And so peak amplitudes would be expected right in this range, right smack in the middle of this, because this is where, the, right smack in this U is right where the pressure and heat release are exactly in phase, and the rate at which I'm pumping energy into the acoustic field is maximized. So I would expect to see the system be quiet pretty much across this whole range. Amplitudes of oscillation start to pick up, peak, drop. Okay, so it, let's say I'm increasing power, I'm changing flame length. Let's just make something up just for fun. Well, as I increase my flame length, I'm, I'm increasing my power, no change, no change, no change, no change, no change. Wham, all of a sudden I start to oscillate and, and uh, uh, the amplitude of oscillation starts to go up, all right? And the operator says, it's gonna blow up. I better not increase my power anymore. But, but you know, you can say, well, actually, just keep, it, keep increasing it, and you're gonna come on the other side of the hill. And this happens, and then it'll actually start to come down again. And this happens all the time. We get these non-monotonic variations. So this is why it's so difficult, is you can't, you can't say anything. It's like, and, and, and uh, you know, I've been involved in situations where somebody will say, you know, I wanna do this, and two operators, GE and Siemens, will have the exact opposite experience with the same change. For example, the example I gave of more propane in the fuel. They'll do a fuel test, and, and it'll drive the pipeline operators crazy because they'll get the exact opposite result when they put a little, you know, the effect is to see what's the effect of propane on the, in, in, on the, on the operability boundaries of the gas turbine fleet. And it does the exact opposite thing. And you can see why, because if one turbine is designed one way and it's, it happens to be parked here and another is over here, it should have a totally different effect. Okay. Um, and so what you can see here is, is that really, you know, this in factor, this, this, this script in, this sensitivity index, this is important. But really what's telling you whether you're inside or outside of stability boundary is tau. So I really want to emphasize this parameter tau now. Yes, sir. Yes, I have a question when you're talking about the different modes. Yeah. The previous slide. So if you're looking at like kind of classical Fourier series solutions to, to PDEs, you know, you might have an oscillation part and you have the exponential growth or decay part. And you can say, well, the first couple modes are what's dominating my solution, so I can only look at those. But here it doesn't look like you have any sort of dependence on the mode, or like mode index. Yeah, so yeah. Is it true that like all of the modes are pretty much no, 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 that, that's a great, a great point. So, you know, this would suggest that you've got an infinite number of natural frequencies. In reality, damping processes are frequency dependent. And so, the most I've ever seen is eight natural frequencies excited at once, which is a lot. Usually you'll see two, sometimes three, and then the higher order modes start to, start to drop off. Yeah, it, it gets truncated because of, of damping and dissipation effects, which are not included in this model. This is a lossless model. Okay, so as I mentioned, it's really tau, this, or this ratio, tau over t, that's controlling where you get instability. So I want to spend a little bit of time now talking about this. Um, and just to illustrate this non-monotonic variation point, this is, again, some data taken from Penn, Penn State, uh, Santa Vica. And what they've done is they've, I'll tell you a little bit later what they did, but bas basically um, they, uh, they varied where the fuel injector was located, and they did a lot of things so that they can vary this tau over t parameter. Okay, so what they did was they ran their combustor over a range of conditions, they measured the frequency of oscillations, that's t, and then they estimated tau by basically they had images of the flame, they took the flame length, they divided the flame length by the flow velocity. That's basically the convection time for a vortex to convect along the flame. So that's where this tau comes from. And you can see that, it, and you see this non monotonic variation. So again, this is what really sets instabilities apart from flashback, from blow off, or from NOx or CO type predictions, this non-monotonic variation. Um, so, so let's just talk for a minute. What can change tau? Well, there's a couple ways that you can that you can do this. And I've, I've talked about flame length, so let's let's come to that one. So here's a geometry I've sketched it yesterday. I have a flame that's stabilized 
in this inner shear layer. And the flame has some length given by L and FL. And what happens is, is oftentimes I'll get this vortex which will shed off this shear layer. It'll convect downstream. And it excites local heat release oscillations all along the flame, but it doesn't completely finish perturbing the flame until it reaches the end. So the, the time delay tau is proportional to the flame length and the flow velocity. So anything that changes the flame length, so I have a sketch here where the flame has two different lengths. Anything that changes the flame length will change this time delay. All right, so, and, and actually this brings me to an important point about predicting instabilities, is, is that um, in order to be able to predict instabilities, we have to be able to understand turbulent combustion in general. Because if you want to, because you got to know where the flame is. Um, and where the flame is is controlled by things like the turbulent burning velocity. So if I have a highly turbulent real combustor, and I said, well, why don't you start by telling me where the flame is without oscillation? And then we can start talking about the sensitivity. If we can't predict that to within certain sensitivity, you can forget about predicting the harmonic response of the system. You first have to understand its baseline um, uh, characteristics without unsteady heat release. And in fact, in, in my opinion, a lot of the uncertainty in instability predictions comes from the fact that we just don't have good turbulent combustion models. Better turbulent combustion modeling could give us better baseline characteristics, which we need to understand unsteady heat release. Another way this time delay could change is if the flame changes its stabilization location. So if you remember yesterday, I showed you images where the flame could abruptly shift from being shear layer stabilized to moving downstream and being stagnation point stabilized. So imagine I'm just merrily operating my system and all of a sudden it bifurcates from one shape to another. I would, that's like a step change in tap, and I can, you would expect to see a step change in, in, in stability boundaries. <coughs> um, this is really nice data that, that illustrates the same point. Um, again, this is from Dom Santanica. And what he did to illustrate this point was he built a special combustor, it was like a trombone, and he could vary the length of this combustor. All right? it turns out that it's hard to, getting a controlled variation of tau is, is tricky, but you can, take, you can control T, the period of oscillation. And by changing the length of this combustor by making it longer and shorter, he changed the natural frequency. Okay, and so that's what's being plotted here. This is combustor length. Um, and then this is a map where he's plotting um, instability amplitude. So the numbers denote amplitude in PSI, all right? So one PSI, two PSI, three PSI, and four PSI. Um, this is the equivalence ratio. So we can, so if you take a look at this, what you'll see is that for a given combustor length, let's just say 38 inches, what will happen is, as I'm increasing equivalence ratio, I'll initially see no change or nominal change background noise levels of pressure. Then the pressure will start to rise. I'll hit one PSI and keep increasing two, then three, then four, but then I'm at the top of the hill and I come back down the backside, then back to three, then two, then one, right? But you can see if I'm nominally operating at 48 inches, what happens? Those same regions, which were really nastily unstable at 35, are actually stable with a combustor that's 48 inches long. Um, same thing. And so this goes to another point is you can't infer uh, you can't infer stability trends from one combustor to another if they have different natural frequencies. And so this has this drives a lot of people who, who make fuel nozzles crazy. So for example, I was talking to a guy who worked for a company called North American, which make um, burners for boilers. All right. And they, they only make the burner, just the burner. Somebody else makes the enclosure that the burner goes into. But some of their combustors are some of their customers are complaining that their burner is lousy, it makes the combustor oscillate. You know, other customers are very happy with it. Well, what's the difference? Is well, you put the burner in one enclosure, it's got one natural frequency, that's like being in one length. You put it in another, identical burner, identical flame, you're somewhere else, it can be unstable. They have no control over this parameter that their burner's got to work on. Um, same thing happened with. Uh, in gas turbines, a, a, a big example happened in the 90s with Siemens, who made who makes very very large um, annular combustion chambers. And so they they designed uh, they they had this idea to design three series. It was called 64-3A, 84-3A, and 94-3A. Three different size turbines, basically three different physical sizes. Those three different sizes were three different power outputs, but the physical size difference meant that they had three different natural frequencies of oscillation. All right. They also said, to save costs, let's, derive, let's develop a single burner to go in all three. 
And what did they find? They found that one of those combustors oscillated like crazy and drove them nuts, you know, where, where, whereas the other system they had no trouble with at all. So they were just happened to be parking. The system was, in, 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 well, let me, let me back up. Tell you what, I won't back up. Well, let me finish my thought. So they happened to be, this combustor happened to be parked, in one case, right smack in the middle of one of these big instability islands, whereas the other was not. And by the way, this plot is unique because you generally can't visualize this space. Normally, a combustor has a fixed geometry, so you're just kind of parked along one of these lines, and you can't, you know, what we're doing here, this is a very special experiment, which lets us back up and see the larger instability sensitivity to these parameters. Generally, once you've got a fixed design, you just have what you have. And so that's what happened with those guys. Does anyone have any questions? Yes? Maybe just a pessimistic question. How, what does this say about designing control systems for combustion instability? Well, I think what it, well, what it tells you is that, uh, one thing it does tell you is, is that no combustor is intrinsically stable or unstable. And so if you have an instability, if you have, you know, one of the things that, that you could do, for instance, if you had a system where you could, with relatively small changes, pop the flame between two locations, you could, if it's stable in one condition, you can move it to the other, and so forth. Yes? I was going to ask about optical axis and gas turbines. So like an engine, we can uh, image through the piston. Is there uh, an equivalent for gas turbines? And what yeah, yeah, some of them do. Some of them use optical sensors to detect light on. So you know they'll, they'll fire the spark, and usually they'll have one, maybe two. For research purposes, or Pardon? for research purposes? No, 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 no. no. Uh, real frame, real, real fuel with gas turbines. Some of them do. Some of them have been pulled out, and they use they use uh, other measurements, temperature measurements. Be interesting to be able to image instability. Oh yeah, yeah. I'm going to show you lots of movies too. Okay. Image all the We do. That's a standard diagnostic to look at either light emissions, chemical luminescence, or if you OH flip. Things like that to, to characterize the dynamics. Yes. So it, it seems to me from this whole discussion that you really can't put something together without looking at the entire system closely. Um, is, is that in fact what these companies are doing now? Or yeah, you can't. Uh, instabilities are a system problem. They're not a flame problem or a burner problem. They're a system problem. So to develop a model, you put together a combustor system model, and usually that means modeling everything from the compressor discharge to the combustor outlet. That's a, that's a reasonably well-defined acoustic system. Yes? Uh, question I've been pondering for the last hour or so. How quickly do these uh, resonant frequencies, how fast do they achieve? Um, how fast do they ramp up? They, I'm assuming they're really fast. Yeah, they'll, they'll go from basically noise to limit cycle amplitude over one or two seconds. Okay. So considering the thought, of, is it possible to purposely Uh, Deer uh, uh, did, did experiments to do exactly that. Pardon? Yeah. To hop, basically. Oh, really? okay. yeah, yeah, so I don't remember what the time scale was. Fractions of a second. So the oscillations would grow, then they come back down. They grow, then come back down. Yeah, that would be said, though, depends on the engine. Right? We did one where we just did like a 10 hertz input and the full engine stabilized it like a dream, but we had a CO count. It, uh, you know, the um, yeah, the, the growth rate is relatively small. You know, these these oscillations. If you have a hundred hertz oscillation, you can just think of it's growing one percent per cycle. The amplitude increases, it takes a hundred cycles, and one percent. Well, one point oh one to the hundredth power. I don't even know what that is. Probably about two. Um, you know, that would that would give you the amount of time to, to double the oscillation. Um, that would be slow bandwidth um, control. There's also a lot of work to develop fast bandwidth active control, where you're actually it's like anti-sound, like these Bose headsets you can buy, where you're actually pumping, pulsing fuel exactly at the frequency of instability of the phase appropriately that you're generating. Is that also I guess, I mean, yeah, yeah, so it's just a matter of time scale. The, the, the nice thing about um, what they did at Nettle was it was slow bandwidth, so it, wasn't, it didn't require um, such a fast actuator. And, you know, so there's lots of questions about life of the actuator, you know, pulsing it a couple hundred hertz over thousands of hours continuous operations, you know, as opposed to 10 hertz or something like that. But that's, that's also been tried. In fact, um, 
you know, there continues to be a lot of research. You know, NASA has some active programs for instabilities in next generation low NOx aero engines, looking at active control. It's been, it's been looked at in a variety of different instances. I just want to, I want to show another set of data that also illustrates this point. This is data um, uh, where they, they basically cooked up, a, it was a pretty neat experiment they did in the lab. Um, and let me just back up to this slide to illustrate what they did. Here's the fuel being injected in, in, this is where the fuel in the air meet, right about here. And you have this mixing section, right? And what can happen is, as I, as I showed you, you have acoustic oscillations in this mixing section. It causes the fuel air ratio to oscillate. And so you get a, a time varying fuel air ratio that convects downstream. And so an important time delay, it turns out that where the fuel is injected, that time delay between where it's injected when it reaches the flame, is an important time delay. And so to demonstrate that point, what they did was, they made this thing movable, and they could actually translate this fuel injection point up and down. All right. So the distance, the x-axis I'm going to show you in the next graph, is this coordinate, this, this distance. All right. um, so that's the fuel injector location, the distance between the fuel injector and the flame. And sure enough, you can see this non-monotonic variation. So this isn't even in the combustor, right? They're making a change that's not even in the combustor, it's in the fuel mixing section. By moving that thing around, they can make instability amplitude go up or down. Um, one, one other set of data I want to show you is this. I, I, I do want to talk about mode switching for a minute because as I mentioned, combustors do have multiple natural frequencies. And the effect, a given change can have one effect on one mode and another effect on another mode. So this is an experiment where we were varying the, the flow velocity in the mixer. That's how we were changing this resonance time. And notice how, and these are two frequencies. This, this is a mode at 430 hertz. This is a mode at 630 hertz. I'm showing you the 48 the spectra over here. You see the big peak at 430 hertz. But as we increase velocity, notice what happens. The amplitude goes up, then it comes down, then it basically goes to zero. But right where this one goes to zero, the 630 hertz motor pops up. So, um, you know, very system specific, this type of behavior. But you know, you can see that the, the frequency, the dominant frequency is moving. But you can understand that from this same type of behavior, you can understand from a graphic, a graphic like I showed you here. That this would be one mode, this would be another. Okay, I am going to skip the other slides where I talk about limit cycles and nonlinear behavior. Does anyone have any questions on this package of material? Okay, let's um, move along then and move to the last topic of today. Lots of movies to keep you awake. And so let's go back to our course outline here. So we just finished our discussion of combustion instabilities. And I've I showed you one movie where I showed you the flames were sensitive to sound, but I really want to, I want to spend the next hour delving into that, okay? And this is my world. Um, trying to understand this piece is when I start knocking flames around, what controls their response, okay? So, um, you know, when I tell people at parties that, that I study the interactions of sound waves with flames, they sometimes wonder where, what the application of that is, but uh, you all know the answer. Um, <laughs> So, but you basically what you ha what I want to do here is I want to. Um, uh, it, th this problem is really part of a more pro general problem: of how do flames respond to disturbances? And really, that's what the turbulent combustion problem is, right? If you think about when you study turbulent combustion, you have broadband random disturbances, and you're saying, how does that change the time average burning rate of a flame, right? And the combustion instability problem we're interested in is what happens if I have harmonic, very narrow band coherent disturbances, what does that do to the unsteady response of the flame? In the turbulent combustion problem, you usually don't, don't worry too much about the unsteady heat release. The, the heat release does oscillate from a turbulent flame. But usually what we're really particularly interested in is the change in time average burning rate. Um, harmonic flow fluctuations do change the time average burning rate of the flame. But what we're particularly interested in is the, the effect of the harmonic flow oscillations on the unsteady heat release. Okay, so what I want to do here is I first want to just give you a feel for what 
flames look like or what they do when they're excited in an unsteady fashion. Then I want to start um, digging into that in a little bit more qu uh, quantitative treatment. Um, so let's jump ahead. And I want to flash back to, I want, I want to go to this slide where I want to flash back to the slide from last session. And basically in this slide I said, the model for the unsteady heat release is the most challenging part. And so for the time being we're going to use this model where the unsteady heat release is proportional to the unsteady velocity with this in town model. So I really want to dig into what controls can and what controls can. Um, so in fact, this would be, these, this is a typical graph of what flame response curves look like. And this is an experiment where we excited the flame uh, with, a, with a speaker. We have harmonic flow oscillations. The amplitude of the unsteady oscillations is on the x-axis. The amplitude of the unsteady heat release is on the y-axis. And you can see that there's this regime, uh, we're in this linear regime, uh, where the, the slope of this curve is basically proportional to that quantity in. It says if I have a 1% fluctuation in velocity, how many what kind of fluctuation do I have in heat release? All right? and in fact, we can actually, that gain, the, the gain of the transfer function, this is n. The slope of this curve, I'm, I'm plotting here as a function of frequency or, or a Struhall number, frequency times flame <coughs> velocity. So when that value of n is 1, what that means is you give me a 5% fluctuation in velocity, you get out a 5% fluctuation in heat release. When it's equal to, say, 0.25, it means 5% fluctuation in velocity gives me 1.25 fluctuation in heat release. And so this is what we want to we want to understand what factors affect the shapes of these curves. Um, just plot them in two different ways. Uh, you know, wh where are they coming from? So let me start by I'm going to show you some me scattering movies. Oh that's a bummer. Okay. Um, So this is a tip. This this is an example of a harmonically excited flame. No sound. Okay, thank you. Um, th what I'm doing is we have a flame stabilized by a blood body, which is down here. Okay, it's basically a, a cylinder, and this is a me scattering image. So what we've done is we've seeded the, the reactant with olive oil. All right, and what happens to olive oil when it goes to the flame? It disappears. All right. So and then you shine a laser through it, and you look at it with a camera, and you got a great planar image of where the flame is because <coughs> the reactants products instantaneous flame from the edge. And you can see, what do you see? Um, I have acoustic waves bouncing up and down, very long wavelength acoustic waves. Um, but you can clearly see I'm exciting a vortex at the separation point of this blood body. See how it's rolling up the whole flame? And then as it propagates downstream, you have flame propagation, which smooths that wrinkle out. This is what it looks like at a lower amplitude. Where I can I can start cranking up the amplitude and it really starts to become obvious this vortex excitation of the flame. Um, you can really see how strong that vortex is that rolls the flame. Up. You have sound waves, excite a vortex, excites the flame, the flame makes more sound, closes the feedback loop. So that's what a that's what a a simple flow, a relatively simple flow, um, excited by the Kelvin, uh, dominated by the inst the Kelvin Helmholtz instability of the two shear layers from this bluff body looks like when you excite it harmonically. You can get some really crazy stuff when you start moving to um, more complicated flow fields. Like this is an OH flip image, so we use uh, planar laser induced fluorescence. So what we did was it's a laser tuned to a line where the OH radical in the products fluoresces, okay? And um, so what you're looking at here is the flow is going left to right. And when you see dark blue, no OH, the color means you have OH. So it's a convenient marker of the flame front because this edge is, uh, is an indicator of where the, where the action is. Um, OH is a long-lived radical in the product, so you have OH lasting farther downstream. And, but anyway, the instantaneous flame is, is this edge. And, um, the reason these flows, one of the reasons these flows look so complicated and multi-connected is it's extremely three-dimensional in the azimuthal direction. You're taking a cut through it, so you're cutting through all that three-dimensionality and imposing two dimensions. But if, if you walk through these images, you can see um, here, 
the, fl the flame surging out, but basically the reactants, you have these oscillations, the reactants are surging out of this annular passage. And so look at this right here. What you're looking at is this is an annular jet of reactants. Here's the flame on this side and that side. So reactants are passing through the products. And you actually excite, the vort you excite a vortex that's so strong, this flow is zinging out of here at 50 meters per second. The vortex takes that flow, spins it around so it's going backwards in the other direction. So you excite that strong of a vortex. Um, and it, it rolls the whole flame up and around. This is another phase of the cycle. And as you keep going, what you'll see is that the flame is now getting shorter, getting shorter. Here, you can just barely see the flame. This flame is almost flashed back, actually. The flow oscillations are so strong that the flame almost goes whipping back upstream into the mixer. And then this cycle repeats itself. So this is what a, an image might look like of a swirl flame. Um, this shows another swirl flame. In this case, the, the, the flame was, was right on the edge of wanting to be stagnation point stabilized. So you can see it's floating out there in the middle. And you can see that leading edge comes zinging back here. It's almost attached to the shear layer here and here. And it gets pushed back downstream again. You see all these really interesting vortical features on the flame. So this is what's really happening in a, in a gas turbine swirl flow when you have these acoustic instabilities. So, um, and our job is to try to understand this behavior and model it sensitivities. Um, so what I want to do is I want to spend some time looking at uh, bluff body stabilized flames because they're, they're a lot simpler to understand. I'm not going to talk about swirl flames. But uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start moving from being qualitative to quantitative. Okay. So this is a whole bunch of different bluff body flames in different conditions. And what, what I'm going to do is I'm now going to start doing some flame edge tracking. And I'm going to just start looking at the dynamics of the instantaneous location of the flame. In fact, I think most of the data that I'm going to show you from here on out, I'm not sure, well, I'm not sure what, what, what data it is. But what I'm going to start doing is, is grabbing the edge of the flame, and I want to start tracking that in time. So you can see some different conditions. This image show an overlay of the instantaneous flame edge at each instant time of overlay. And let's look at this one. This is an interesting one. Um, because if, have any of you ever looked at these images for a turbine? If you have a turbulent flame, attached on flame holder, what those images look like. And I, and I grab a whole bunch of instantaneous flame edges and I overlay them. You see a growing brush, right, with downstream distance. So if I had, a, if I had this with a terminal flame, what I would see would be um, okay, I'm not drawing this well at all. What I'm trying to illustrate is, is that the, the degree of wrinkling grows monotonically with downstream distance as the flame brush grows. It doesn't happen when you, it doesn't necessarily happen with harmonic flow forcing. Look at this one right here. Almost no wrinkling here. Almost no fluctuation, right? They all converge to a point because the flame's attached. It's getting knocked around, but it's not moving. You can see the magnitude of the wrinkles is growing. It actually starts decreasing again, and then it does something else. Th this flame at 170 meters per second, the wrinkling is totally dominated by the turbulent flame brush growth, which is why it, it looks more like a turbulent flame. There is some coherent motion in there, but it's, turbulence is just so strong in the barrier. So it's easier to see in this lower velocity case. Again, what I want to do is I want to help you understand, and I want to explain this, this trend right here. Um, so we need to move toward quantification now. So let's take the same situation. Now I've turned the flow sideways. The flow is going left to right. And I'm going to define the instantaneous edge of the flame by L. All right? So at each spatial position, x, I'm going to define the flame position by a time series, L of t. So L is oscillating in time. All right? And then at a different position, I'll get another L of x, another L of t. All right? So this just shows what a typical L, we didn't even, it's still in pixels, didn't convert to physical units. This just shows the oscillation of the flame position as a function of time is oscillating. You can see that. I can take the Fourier transform. This shows L prime as a function of frequency. You see a very strong peak of 300 hertz where I was exciting this flame, 300 hertz. OK, so the flame is responding to my excitation. Um, and then what I can do is I can start, I want to show you what starts happening at other spatial locations. So I'm going to take that same graph, and I'm going to add another dimension to it. All right? So I just showed you L prime is a function of f. Now I'm normalizing f by the force and frequency. That's what f naught means here. You see the peak of 1. So this is one physical location. Here's another, another, another. And so you can see. In fact, I'll draw a line. Let's see what I want to say there. Um, this line, I'm going to draw that along 
This is the envelope of the flame response at the forcing frequency. And you see this non-monotonic behavior. All right? So that's interesting. Why is the flame doing this? Why is it, why is it respond? Why is the magnitude of fluctuation responding non-monotonically? All right? Well, actually, you could have all predicted that this would happen because I showed you this behavior before, right? Where I showed you the same, well, not the same flame, but a similar flame. You can see the, the growth and the magnitude of rank length of the decay. Yes, sir? What is this exploitation that you're denoting? What is the what? The exploitation, what is what? Uh, this is just axial distance downstream. So um, what I'm plotting you here is, so x equals zero is right here. And as I'm increasing x, I'm plotting the magnitude of the fluctuations at, as a function of downstream distance in the frequency domain. All right, so ask me questions, because I'm going to, this plot, we're going to talk about it for 45 minutes. So I want to make sure everybody understands what I'm plotting here. Yes, sir? It's a little bit hard to tell from the angle, but the frequency changing. Yeah, it's right bang on uh, the forcing frequency. The only thing that's happening is the background noise floor is coming up. You see that? Yeah. That's turbulent, that's turbulent flame wrinkling. The magnitude of wrinkling due to broadband motion is rising. And if I hadn't truncated this, you could also see the growth of harmonics due to nonlinear effects at higher as, as you move down the stream. Okay, so now what I want to do is I only want to focus on the flame response at the forcing frequency. So I'm going to collapse this graph back down in two dimensions. I'm going to take the, the frequency axis off, and I'm just going to plot this envelope as a function of spatial location. All right? So this is, actually I grabbed a different flame here. This is a different set of data. But this shows you the magnitude of the, <coughs> of the flame wrinkling as a function of downstream distance. So what this is showing you, again, this is in space, not in time. So at this location, this magnitude tells you how much the flame is wrinkling. It's not wrinkling a lot. This location is wrinkling a lot. This wrinkle, and then it, it decays again. All right. So this is the magnitude of the fluctuations of the flame wrinkling. How much the flame is flapping side to side. And this is proportional to the magnitude of the unsteady heat release at each position as well. This curve right here shows the phase. All right. The phase with respect to x equals zero. This phase is monotonic, is almost linearly varying with downstream distance. So this is phase and radiance of the flame wrinkling as a function of downstream distance. It turns out that this is a pretty typical behavior for flame response curves, is that the phase, the phase of the unsteady heat release rolls off with downstream distance. What this is telling you is, is that I have a wrinkle on the flame which is convecting downstream at an almost constant speed. Because right? if you think about it, if I have an oscillation, well, if I have a flame going in this direction, the flame is oscillating harmonically here. I have that same wrinkle, which is convecting downstream. I'm going to see that same wrinkle a certain time delay later, a certain phase shift. Farther downstream, I'll see a bigger phase shift, but I'll see the same wrinkle. Farther downstream, the same thing. So that's what this is showing you. In fact, you can, ex you can infer how fast that wrinkle is moving on the flame from the slope of this curve. Okay. So, so let's, let's talk about this curve. What you can see is you have low amplitude flame fluctuation right near the attachment point, and the magnitude of flame wrinkling initially grows uh, downstream. It peaks in amplitude, then very interesting, it, it starts to decay, it starts to go away. Right? This is not something we see with turbulent flames. With turbulent flames, you generally see monotonic growth in flame brush thickness with downstream distance. When you excite a flame narrow band, temporally coherent, you see this type of behavior. Um, in fact, you can, you can get, here I'm going to show you results from other flames that you can get variations on a theme. Um, you can see similar type of behavior here. You see the rise, you see the peak. We didn't get it far enough downstream, but it's actually going to fall. But on top of that, you can see this modulation in, in flame wrinkling amplitude. Um, or what you can even see sometimes, this is kind of a really crazy one, is you can see kind of like a standing wave behavior where you have no, almost no wrinkle from the flame at this location or this location. Big wrinkles here, big wrinkles there. And you see this, this type of behavior. So it starts to look like there's some interference behavior going on that's controlling these um, flame dynamics. And in fact, that's what I'm going to show you. These flames are controlled by interference phenomena. OK, so let's analyze these. And what I'm going to show you is that there's, to analyze these, I'm going to break this problem into four pieces. Um, First, I'm going to talk about what happens when you create wrinkles on the flame. What happens to them? Then I'm going to talk about how you excite wrinkles <coughs> in the first place. 
Then I want to talk about interference processes, and then I want to talk about how wrinkles get destroyed. Okay, in order to do this, I'm going, we're going to start using equations. I'm going to use the G equation. How many of you are familiar with the level set or the G equation? Okay, so what I've done here is, um, if you're not familiar with it, that's okay. The, the, uh, actually, this is not the full G equation. The G equation is a simplified equation that describes the space-time dynamics of premixed flame sheets. All right? So if you treat a premixed flame as a very thin sheet, which is a good approximation for these types of problems, it's basically an interface that is moving with the flow, but it's also propagating normally to itself at the local flame speed. That's what premixed flames do. So if you take what I just said in words and you write an equation, you get, you get this thing. All right. So this just says things are changing in time. This term right here just says the flame is getting moved around by the flow. This term right here says, and the flame is everywhere propagating normal to itself at the, the flame speed, what I've called SL. I've actually changed notation from yesterday. I didn't update my slides. But this is the laminar flame speed. And you get this nasty little nonlinearity here. This is just purely illustrative. This nasty nonlinearity comes from the fact that the flame is propagating normally to itself. So the flame is, is whatever orientation it has, it's moving normal to its local. It's, it's propagating normal to itself. And that, that, that gives, gives us lots of headaches with analyzing this problem analytically, is this geometric, geometric nonlinearity that's present in um, premixed flames. OK, so the, um, what I'm also showing you here is just to, just to make sure we're on the same page, L is the instantaneous flame position, and L is a function of space and time. SL is the flame speed. I already said that. And so this is an equation for the space-time dynamics of the flame position, L. So I just showed you data of what L of X and T does. Now I want to talk about the space-time dynamics of L. And um, one important assumption that I've made in writing this equation is that the flame position is a single value function of x. So at each x, there's only one flame. So that, and that's actually an assumption we break down at very high disturbance amplitudes where the flame starts to get rolled up around itself and it becomes multi-value. Then you have to solve the full level set equation. So I've actually already simplified the level set equation to have one step. Does anyone have any questions about this? What's Vf? Oh, Vf, that is the velocity. This is the, these are the two velocity components at the flame. So the velocity is a um, vector. It's a, it's a field quantity in general. But for the flame dynamics, I only care about its value at the flame itself. And that's what the subscript F notes. Thank you for asking. OK, so let's start by talking about wrinkle convection and flame relaxation processes. OK, so everybody here has taken combustion. And I want to show you a very interesting problem to test your intuition. And that is, let me just why do I need to write it down and have it here? I have a um, flame stabilized at a point, and there's some flow, I'll call it UA. At time t equals zero, I make a step change to UB. Okay? So at UA, the, uh, where, where, um, where UB is greater than UA. All right, so I'm going to make a step increase in flow velocity. Well, what happens? Well, you know, at time zero, the flame looks like this. There's going to be some transient. The flame will settle out to its final shape. Well, let's just let me draw it. That's why I was going to write this, I guess. Um, so here's my point flame holder. This is time t equals zero. Steady state position of the flame at some later time is that. How does the flame go from that to that? So I'll let you think about that for a minute. Pardon? No, I'm asking, well, we'll talk about the physical reason, but just first, what does it do? Does, it, does the whole thing just swing around? Or how does, I'm saying, if you had to draw at four different time instances what the flame looked like, where time t equals zero looks like this, and at some large time later it looked like that, how does the flame go from this to that? That's what I'm asking. What do you think about it? Change the velocity from the time there? Yep, step change. Uniform, spatially uniform, this is totally a cooked up problem. Um, I have uniform, spatially uniform velocity everywhere equal to UA. I make a step change in velocity to UB. So how does the, and, and, I, and you all know enough about combustion to know that the flame is, is at some angle theta with respect to the approach flow where theta is either equal to SL over U. So if I double the flow velocity, I'm going to change that angle. The flame is going to be at a steeper angle. 
Does everybody understand the, the, the problem that I pose? Okay. Well, if, you, if I was sitting in your seat, I would say, well, I think the plane will probably just swing from this to that. It turns out it doesn't do that at all. What it does is this. Okay, so what happens is, is that the flame, at the flame holder, the flame changes its angle, okay? And that that, in, 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 so at some later time, the flame looks like this. And then some later time still, it looks like that. And some later time still, it looks like that. So isn't that cool? Um, and, and what's happening is, is that Right at the flame holder, the flame's got to stay fixed. It changes its angle immediately. And then what happens is, essentially, there's this wave that moves down, moves downstream along the flame. All right, and that wave moves downstream in a speed proportional to the flow velocity. I'll, I'll, I'll show you what that speed is later. Why does the vertex stay fixed? Why? Why is that fixed? Because I'm, I'm telling you, that's, um, that's, that's, oh, in, that's to find to stay fixed. Yep, to find to stay fixed. Yeah. How do you like the correlation in that? Right, the flame holder that sees the first increase in velocity, but as you walk down the length of the flame, as you walk on the same surface, it sees that increase at later times. No, but that's not what I'm doing, right? Mm -hmm. I said spatially. I said I'm this. I'm going to set the flow velocity oh, to UV everywhere. There's no. There's, okay. This is not a, a, a flow. This is not the flow. This is not following the flow. I have at time t equals zero made the flow velocity everywhere equal to the new number. Okay. So not like you no, like I said, this is a made-up problem, right? Where I could, could, could all of a sudden step change the velocity everywhere, and, and even in that case, the flame response is not instant. It doesn't go, it doesn't go from one to the other. Rather, there's this there's this slope change. Um, it moves basically from some theta one, which would be given by the initial, to some theta two, and that slope change moves downstream. It basically, kind of, you can think of it as a convex downstream. Yes. So where you have that hole, like the, you know, the original kind of does that stay at the same angle as it was originally, or is that kind of? Yes, so this angle is not changing right here. And this angle is not changing. It's right. only that point. That's right. Yep. So you, basically, the solution you have <coughs> constructed geometrically is that you have a step change from theta 1 to theta 2. Where theta 1 is the initial value of UA, theta 2 is the final value of UB. I like this problem because it's so simple, but it really bends your intuition. So if you reduce the velocity to restore to that first angle, the propagation will probably still follow that. Yeah, you get the similar similar type deal, except now you'd have a, um, uh, the, the, you'd get, um, you would get, uh, let's see. Why can't I draw it? Yeah, so then the angle would change like this, and then it would go like that, and then like this, and then like that, like that. Okay? Um, yes? Oh, this is just, there is, this is just purely um, kinematics. The fact that I have a, a surface that's, moved, that's getting pushed by the flow and propagating normal to itself. So, the heat, Conduction is all built into the SL, but other than that, I just this is just the solution of this equation right here so for this initial value problem. Okay, so the way the flame relaxes, so this tells you that flames have memory, okay, that, that they don't respond instantly to disturbances, that there's some time delay, okay, and so this now you I hope you're starting to see the connection where these time delays are coming from is the fact that flames take a certain amount of time to respond. And, and you can kind of think of this problem as, there, there's, in fact, the, the uh, well, you can basically think of this disturbance, this kink, as like a shock propagating along the solution, along the flame. And basically, this disturbance is moving downstream such that at each instant, that kink is located at the position C shock. In fact, this, uh, the, the governing equation is a more general form of the, uh, of the um, Riemann equations where you, where you have a, uh, so, so you admit shockwave type solutions. Um, okay.
So what's what's happening here? Um, this is a. Uh, in order to illustrate this, what's happening is is here I'm drawing that same flame. Forget about this for a minute. But and, and let's think about what's happening. Is I have the flow, which has some ve which is pushing the flame downstream at some speed u not. The flame is propagating normal to itself at a speed SL. So let's take the vector superposition of those. And the wrinkle along the flame then moves at this speed, which I'm going to call UT. Okay. And so you can see that, that, that it is, in fact, a convection-like phenomenon. That it's the, the wrinkle is not moving at the flow velocity, but it's proportional to the flow velocity. It's the vector superposition of the flow and the flame speed normal to itself. Um, projected along the flame. Uh, okay? And so I'm going to call this speed, uh, and, and, and since I've been plotting things as a function of, of, of um, axial distance downstream, this, this is the speed at which the wrinkle moves along the plane, ut. I'm going to call its projection in the axial direction ucf. So this is the, the axial speed at which wrinkles are moving along the plane. All right? Um, and so what this tells you right away is that flame, oftentimes when people see flames, they say, oh, the disturbance is convecting with the flow. In fact, it's not. It's, it's related to the flow, but it's not the flow. It's all, there's also flame propagation also affects the, the propagation speed. Just to illustrate this point, I have some data here where I'm plotting the, um, the uh, speed. Of, okay, um, the x-axis is a velocity normalized by the mean velocity. The, the x-axis is location. The y-axis is velocity. If you have a value of 1, it means whatever wrinkle you're looking at, whatever disturbance is moving with the flow. The, um, the, this line right here with the, the solid symbols, we did PID measurements and we inferred the speed of the vortex that was moving along the plane. Because if you look at these flames, you say, oh, you, know, you see this vort vortical roll-up moving downstream. You say, oh, I'm just watching the vortex moving along the plane. That is this speed. That's this thing right here. This right here is the inferred speed from these me scattering images of the flame wrinkle. And notice that the convection speed of the flame wrinkle, which I'm calling UCF, the convection speed of the vortex, which I'm going to call UCV, are not the same thing. So you have these three velocities. You have the flow velocity, you have the vortex convection speed. The vortex isn't moving at the flow speed because the vortex is sitting on the shear layer. It's some intermediate velocity. And you have the flame wrinkle, which is moving at a different speed. And that creates all kinds of interesting physics um, for interference. The fact that these velocities aren't the same creates all this a lot of interesting stuff, which I want to get into. OK, so to, um, to analyze this problem a little bit more quantitatively, what I want to do is I want to start building up your intuition. And, and um, let me jump back to this picture. What they, what, this is an experiment. This is a fairly classical experiment. What, the, what they did was they took a bluff body. And, they created no flow oscillations. They just shook the bluff body from side to side, it created these wrinkles. Um, and you can see that by shaking the flame from side to side, rather than the whole flame just moving in bulk back and forth, you create these wrinkles locally. These wrinkles are then convecting downstream to get these harmonic oscillations in flame position. So let's, uh, let's look at that problem. If I have a harmonically oscillating bluff body, the um, if you take the, the level set equation in if you assume small amplitude flame wrinkles, and you assume that the flame speed is a constant, forget stretch effects for a minute, then what happens is with this problem is you excite a flame wrinkle with a spatially constant amplitude. So if I make a plot of the magnitude of the flame wrinkle as a function of downstream distance, flat line, okay, I excite a wrinkle on the flame, it just, zip, it just moves along the flame at constant amplitude and with a phase that just rolls off linearly because it's, it's convecting at this speed you see it. Okay? So you excite a flame wrinkle with spatially constant amplitude in the phase um, when it already varies. Um, OK, so that's, that's how wrinkles propagate. Now let me talk about how do you excite wrinkles. All right? In order to do this, I want to go to the level set equation, and I'm going to solve it. All right? The level set equation is a nasty nonlinear equation. I can only write an analytic solution if I linearize it. So let me linearize it, and I'll just tell you the answer. This is the answer, not for the flame position, but the slope of the flame position. It turns out that's a, a more convenient variable we'll look at. So the instantaneous slope of the flame as a function of space and time is a superposition of two terms, all right? And just let me just, just to make sure we're all on the same page. 
you can see this u in prime. u in prime is the fluctuating velocity in normal tube point. All right, and you can see it shows up in both spots in both terms. So this is the forcing function. Velocity fluctuations normal to the flame sheet whack the flame around. Okay, and then you can also see these terms u t. This is the tangential velocity along the flame. And so if you see both terms, you see this t minus x on u t. T minus there is a convolution integral x on u t. This is that wrinkle convection. This just tells you that I create a wrinkle in the flame that's convecting downstream at the speed of u t. Um, so let's start. I, I, like I said, I want to build up intuition. So the first problem I said, let's think about if I just have an oscillatory flame holder and I create a constant amplitude wrinkle. Now let me look at this problem. The next problem I want to look at is let me have a stationary flame holder and let me have a bulk flow fluctuation. So let me let the whole flow oscillate in time in bulk. All right? So the whole flow is just is oscillating up and down. So if that happens, this first term, which is a spatial derivative of the fluctuating velocity, this whole term goes away. And this tells me that my space-time wrinkling the flame is just equal to this term. And so what it tells you that is that you have unsteady velocity fluctuation, uh, this u in prime uh, at, at x equals 0. This is, this is the uh, unsteady velocity at the flame attachment. What happens is, this is kind of like this problem here, is you generate a wave at the attachment point, and then it just convects downstream. And because, and so this is actually the linearized solution version of this problem, except this was a transient problem, this is a harmonic problem. But, well, I want to look at a harmonic problem. It just says, you, whatever fluctuating velocity you create at the attachment point, it's just going to convect downstream. Um, in fact, this is what we see when we do experiments. This is a Bunsen, can you guys see this? Do you mind hitting the light for just a minute? Um, the flow is going up, is going bottom to top. This is a ring of pilot flames to stabilize the flame. And you're looking at the Bunsen flame. And if you see, what, what, you'll, what you'll see is the angle at the attachment point is oscillating. And then if you allow your eye to move down the flame in a Lagrangian fashion, you'll see that that angle isn't changing really. It's moving downstream. That's what this says here. So you create a wrinkle, and then that wrinkle just moves downstream. But because the unsteady velocity at the attachment point is oscillating, the angle is oscillating. And that creates this wrinkle. You can turn it back on. Thank you. Um, and so this is interesting because what this tells you is that it, if your excitation velocity is spatially uniform, the flame response is exclusively controlled by flame attachment. Flame, the fact that if you have an attached flame that's not moving, that, that is the answer. That totally controls the space-time dynamics of the flame. So this, is, this raises all kinds of interesting fundamental problems. Is what you, you, In reality, you have this. Um, this boundary, what I'm going to call this boundary condition, what is happening to the flame right at the attachment point? Is it really staying fixed or is it moving? Because that controls the spatially uniform flame problems. The response of the anchoring point of a premixed flame to flow oscillations. OK, so let me jump ahead here. And um, just for time's sake, I have some things to show you that I'm, that I'm not making stuff up that you can compare with data. It looks good. OK. Let's jump to this slide right here. And look at this problem here a little bit more. What I have here now is um, I've taken the same kind of data that I've shown you before. Now I'm jumping to data. I'm plotting L prime as a function of downstream distance. And I'm showing you these curves at three different disturbance amplitudes. And so you can see flame, no fluctuation at the attachment point. The magnitude of the fluctuation grows with downstream. Right, now we'll, we'll keep talking about that. But this, the reason there's no fluctuation is because the attachment can't move. You, you, you launch these waves you know, to, to cause the amplitude of oscillation to grow. Um, and then also, as you'd expect, as you increase the forcing amplitude, <coughs> the magnitude of flame wrinkling is growing. When you hit it in a bigger amplitude, you get more wrinkles. Even bigger amplitude, you get even more wrinkles. Um, OK. So, if you take this same data and you normalize it by the excitation amplitude, you get this. All right? And notice what happens. I took the same data. I normalized L prime by U prime. And notice how all the data collapses onto a line right in the near field. All right? But it doesn't collapse in the far field. All right? So what is this telling you? This tells me that my near field flame dynamics are essentially linear, that I can, I can model, I can understand what's happening right in, in, in the first half of the flame 
by purely linear process, <coughs> purely linear problems. But it also tells me if I want to understand what's happening far downstream, I got to include nonlinear effects. Um, okay, so I've talked about how wrinkles are excited. Now I want to talk about interference processes. In order to do that, I want to go to this, go back to this linearized solution to the flame dynamics. And I previously showed you if you have a uniform flow field, this term controls the problem. It's controlled by flame attachment. If you have a non-uniform problem, like if you have a vortex, you have this fluctuating vortex, the fluctuating velocity field varies in space. Then you have this term right here, all right? And what happens there is, is that this vortex, these unsteady velocity disturbances, they create, they wrinkle the flame in every location. But what's happening is, is, is I have a vortex, it excites the flame, let's just say flow is going up, up. Here's my flame. The vortex excites the flame. Once I disturb the flame, that the flame generates a wrinkle which propagates downstream, right? In and of itself, even if I could instantly shut that vortex off. Suppose I could have a vortex, it hits the flame, and then I just turn it off. It would create a wrinkle, and the wrinkle would propagate along the flame. Well, in reality, the vortex doesn't get turned off, right? The vortex wrinkles the flame, it launches this wrinkle. But then it convects along, and it wrinkles the flame again, and it launches another wrinkle. Then it convects, and it launches another wrinkle. So what that means is, if I want to say, well, what's wrinkling the flame here, all right? It's equal to a space-time convolution of the entire disturbance history at all upstream locations. See that? So in other words, it's the, the wrinkle here is a function of what's the vortex doing right now. But it's also a function of what the vortex did a millisecond ago. And then it's also a function of what the vortex was doing two milliseconds ago. So flames are non-local in space and time. Flames have memory. It's a really interesting problem. Um, actually, it has lots of interesting implications also for turbulent combustion problems because Oftentimes, turbulent models assume that flame wrinkling at this location is a function of the fluctuating velocity field at that location. In fact, in flames with tangential flow, as soon as you have tangential flow, the wrinkle here on a turbulent flame is a function of the entire space-time history of the disturbance field. Um, and so this is why you get this convolution integral. This convolution integral just says, in math form, what I just told you before, is that the wrinkle is a function of whatever the disturbance field did at each upstream time, and then I just have to phase shift it by whatever the time delay is. OK? OK, well, why is this really interesting? Is because, as I just told you, a vortex <coughs> is moving at some speed. I call it UCV. But the flame wrinkle that it excites is moving at the speed, well, UCF, <coughs> UT. I'm changing notation on you. Sorry. And as I, sh I showed you this graph before, to show you that those two velocities weren't the same. Vortex convection speed, flame wrinkles. What do you think that's going to do? I have this vortex. It's creating this wrinkle moving at one speed. But, I, but now I, I keep creating more wrinkles, which are moving at another. And, and, the, and the, the, the wrinkle disturbance source is moving at another speed. So I'm going to be generating all this stuff. But I, I, can you see that you're going to create opportunities for interference? Is that those disturbances are going to be in phase at some locations downstream, because they'll, arrive at, they'll all arrive at the same time, and you get a big old flame wrinkle, and other locations will be out of phase. And so I mentioned to you before how you could see some reminiscences of interference effects. And this is why. is because usually what's happening is, is the flame is being disturbed by these vortices, which are moving at a speed different in which the flame naturally relaxes to, the, to those disturbances. And the fact that the flame is memory. Um, I'm just going to skip over that slide to illustrate, to, just to keep moving here. Just to illustrate this, let's solve. Let, let, let me write an exact solution. Let me solve this. I wrote it in general form. Let me assume that I have a have a disturbance field with this form. So I'm going to assume that I have a fluctuating velocity field um, given by u n prime. And don't get hung up on the math. Basically, I have a fluctuating the velocity field is is convecting downstream with constant amplitude at the speed of u c v. So I got a vortex. I'm going to freeze its amplitude, but it's just going to move at a speed of u c v downstream. Okay? So if you solve the linearized level set equation, this is the solution. All right? There it is. And that's what it is. And let me just show you what it looks like graphically. Um, this is the magnitude of the flame wrinkling. This is downstream distance. And I keep changing notation. Here I'm calling it y. It's what I previously called x. Um, but you can clearly see this interference behavior. Big wrinkle, and in other locations, no wrinkles. So this is really interesting. It's telling me that you know if you were, you you could look at this location, and say flame's not moving, it's it's rock still. There's probably no flow fluctuation there. Well, you could have a, you could have this vortex just banging away on the flame at that location, 
but because of interference from all the wrinkles created upstream, you end up with no net wrinkling of the flame right here. Whereas you get big, much bigger amplitude oscillations than you'd expect for a given vortex strength here. So you get this really interesting interference effects. So let's just contract, let's think about this for a minute. Um, you, get behave, you get curves that look like this in standing waves in acoustics. Well, why do you get standing waves in acoustics? You have two disturbances moving at the same speed in opposite directions, and you get a standing wave. This is actually not exactly a standing wave, but you, the, the spatial pattern looks like a standing wave. What's happening here is you have two disturbances moving in the same direction, but at different speeds, and they just move in and out of phase with each other because they're harmonically oscillating. All right. So this shows you, this is an interesting problem because it shows you in the limit of what happens when you have a vortex with constant amplitude, what you expect to see the flame wrinkling to look like. You'd expect to see the flame wrinkle just have this oscillatory pattern with downstream distance. In reality, no vortices always decay with downstream distance, so this oscillatory pattern dies out as you go downstream. What you also introduce is a new length scale. All right? A new length scale pops out of this analysis. I'm going to call it lambda interference. All right, and here's a formula for lambda interference. Lambda interference is a function of, of the ratio between the vortex convection speed and the natural um, speed of this wrinkle propagate along the plane. All right, so you have this wrinkle propagation speed of vortex convection speed. That ratio minus one gives you this interference waveform. So what this tells you is if the vortex is moving at exactly the speed of the wrinkle, UT on UCV is equal to 1. The interference wavelength is infinite. So there's no, no interference is what that says. Then um, what this flame response curve would look like would be that. But as soon as you start to, as soon as they move at a different speed, you get this interference behavior. And you get this, and, and you get this uh, natural wavelength by which flame wrinkles form proportional to this difference in velocity. And, we, and, and you can see these. Go, as I, I, here's some images. I showed you this data earlier. You can see these interference patterns on the flame wrinkles. Exactly what we see. Anybody want to hazard a guess what's happening here? You see, you see the big, you see one big wrinkle, uh, uh, one big uh, interference peak right here. But then you see these three smaller interference peaks stacked on top of it. So what's happening with this big interference peak we're only seeing one, one of the, our viewing window cuts all this out. We only see this. But why do we see the, you can see there's two, actually two length scales going on there. Well, what you're seeing here is the combined effect of both acoustic and vortical disturbances exciting the flame. All right? The, there's an interesting point I want to make here is that for wave propagation, the wavelength of disturbance is directly proportional to the speed of sound, and the speed of disturbance propagation. So acoustic waves have very long wavelengths because they propagate fast. Vertical disturbances have short wavelengths because they propagate short. This wavelength, what matters is the ratio between the flame response and the, um, the flame response velocity and the disturbance propagation velocity. So if your disturbance is moving at almost the same speed as the flame relaxation, this wavelength becomes very large. All right. So if you think about it, if I have two types of disturbances exciting my flame at the same time, a convecting disturbance moving at the flow speed, close to but not quite equal to UCV, uh, excuse me, UCF, and then I have a sound disturbance which is moving very, very fast, what that tells me is the sound um, wave is going to give me a much, much shorter wrinkling wavelength than the vortical disturbance. All right? And that's exactly what's happening here is this, this is a nice reflection of the fact that you have this long wavelength wrinkle. That's the big vortex that's convecting along, and you're seeing one interference pattern on it. But there's also a smaller amplitude acoustic wave on the background that's moving much, much faster. It's creating this much shorter wavelength wrinkling on the plane. Um, so again, you can see this effect of flow oscillations that there's these two fundamental canonical types of disturbances making the flow move around, an acoustic wave and a vortical disturbance. Um, OK, so I'm going to, I have some comparison with data. I'm going to skip this. Um, just as a, as a little bit of a side, I want to, again, I want to differentiate this harmonic flame excitation problem from the, more, from the other problem we're also interested in of 
turbulent combustion where you have a flame being disturbed by broadband random disturbances. So if I were to take that exact same model problem, and instead of hitting the flame with a coherent harmonically oscillating flow, which gives me this type of behavior, if I were to hit it with broadband random fluctuations, I would just see that, all right? And, the, and, the, and the, the reason for this just purely comes down to time coherence, is that the, uh, the turbulent fluctuation is not correlated with itself after some correlation time. And in order to get co interference, either constructive or destructive, you've got to have that, that temporal coherence. And so these oscillations, basically, you get, it's like a diffusion process or a random walk. And you get this monotonic growth in turbulent flame brush that we had talked about before. Whereas harmonically forced flames don't have a monotonic degrowing flame brush. They have a flame brush that gets thicker, thinner, and thicker, and thinner, and thicker, and thinner. And in a real turbulent flame, what you see is a superposition of the broadband and the narrowband part, where you see, you see thicker, thinner, thicker, thinner, plus just the thicker part. All right. Last thing I want to talk about is um, why do flame wrinkles go away? By the way, um, we, all the instructors made a deal that we're going to stagger when we leave. And you lucky ducks get to get out the latest, we're going to finish at 12.25. So, uh, <laughs> hopefully there's still some food left. The, the kinetics <laughs> class is letting out as we speak, and the, uh, the other class is letting out in 10 minutes, so we, we have a staggered exit this time. That was our strategy. So should we stand up for just a minute? Why don't we stand up for a minute? Um, <laughs> So, the, uh, so I've talked with you about how you create wrinkles on the plane. I've talked with you about how those wrinkles propagate. And the key thing I just emphasized was that because the thing that's exciting wrinkles is not moving at the same speed at which wrinkles are propagating on the plane. It's really interesting interference behavior. Fundamentally different from turbulence because it's temporally coherent. Last thing I want to talk with you now about is flame wrinkle destruction processes. What causes flame wrinkles to go away once they're there? Right. Um, and in order to, under, to, to order, understand this is actually very intuitive. Um, this is a nice, a nice drawing from Professor Law's uh, review paper. If you take a flame and you make a harmonic wrinkle on it, and then say, what do flames do? They propagate normal to themselves. What's, what happens? If I take this flame and I say, what will it look like a, a time instant later if I let it propagate normal to itself? Look what happens. Get smoothed out. And in fact, this branch and that branch start to collide and you start getting destruction of flame surface area. So, this is that geometric effect of flames. And so, in fact, it turns out that if you take a, a flame, a wrinkled flame, and you put it, let's say you could somehow magically wrinkle a flame and you put it in a uniform flow field, the wrinkle will always smooth itself out. Flames have this property that they're always trying to kill, smooth themselves out. They're always trying to smooth out wrinkles. Um, and so, in, in fact, uh, this is a video I showed you earlier. You can see this, this process. Um, if you watch this wrinkle that's excited down here, you'll see it's nice, smooth. And as you watch it move upstream, you can see it getting cusped and corrugated because that wrinkle's propagating normal to itself. And so just like I showed you here, the, uh, the convex part the wavelength, the, the, the length scale of the convex part is continuously decreasing. See, as you go from here to there, it's decreasing. The wavelength of the concave part is increasing. So it's a nonlinear effect where, the, where, you, where you start making new length scales in the problem. And you can see that here. You see the really long wavelength, whatever, I can't remember if it was convex or concave. And you see the really short feature there. And this is happening in space as the plane evolves. So th this, is, this is what's happening here. Um, so the way this manifests itself typically in this problem is through vortex roll. And I showed you a, a movie of this, so I, I think you can see what's happening. If, if a flame was a passive scalar and you had a strong vortex, this is what the flame would look like, right? Or a passive scalar. In reality, flames propagate normal to themselves. And so depending upon how strong the vortex is relative to the, to the flame speed, the flame may actually never actually even look like this. It may only look like this because it's even as the vortex is rolling the flame around, the flame is propagating normal to itself, smoothing itself back out. Or what could also happen is, is that at, at different, actually I have a movie to show this point, is what's happening here is this same process is happening spatially. Is, is that you've got this really strong vortex and it rolls the whole flame up downstream, but as you move downstream, the flame's propagating normal to itself. It's getting, the wrinkles getting 
things moved out. Now, this comes from this term in that level set equation, all right? It's that geometric nonlinear nonlinearity. So this process is amplitude dependent, strongly nonlinear. It's actually strongly frequency dependent as well. You can't understand flame wrinkle destruction from a linear analysis. So I linearized the level set equation. I showed you solutions. We can understand wrinkle generation and wrinkle propagation from linear concepts. You cannot do that for flame destruction. Flame destruction is an intrinsically nonlinear process, uh, which means it's amplitude dependent. Um, so just to illustrate that, let me show you a movie. If we go back to that oscillating flame holder problem, so if I oscillate a flame holder, remember I told you in the linear constant burning velocity framework, framework, the wrinkle propagates with constant amplitude. The wrinkle amplitude does not change with downstream distance. All right? What I want to do now is this is a simulation, and I've turned the nonlinearity on. And you'll see that if I only had linear, prop, linear effects, this wrinkle would just move along with unchanged shape, harmonically oscillating. Because of kinematic restoration, look how it gets smoothed out as I move downstream. All right. Um, and so you can actually see this. If you think back to this data that I showed you earlier, remember I took the, the flame response data and I normalized it by the excitation amplitude. And I said, look, it, it all collapses on top of itself in the near field. I can understand this excitation process from, so it's a linear process. But notice how all the different excitation amplitudes diverge in the far field. And that's, that's this kinematic restoration effect going on. Um, in fact, just to show that, what I have here is, if you take um, the linearized solution of the G equation um, for one set of calculations, this is, this is what you get for three different excitation amplitudes. And they're just rescaled versions of each other because I've linearized it. If I then take the same problem and I solve it with the nonlinear terms, notice how you get basically the same solution right in the near field, but notice how it starts to diverge in the far field. And this is flame propagation normal to itself out. And then look what happens as I go up in amplitude. The effect starts turning on earlier and earlier in space, and as the amplitude goes up, notice how much quicker it decays. So this is this, this um, the flames have this saturated behavior. You hit them harder, they don't necessarily wrinkle twice as much. They have a saturated behavior. Notice how here, in fact, notice that this, in the linearized version, look at the difference in amplitude, a factor of two for the linearized solution but the nonlinear solution, almost the exact same response. And that's actually what's happening here. If you think back to this curve that I showed you, it's the same data, unnormalized now. Notice how this high amplitude response curve out here is basically almost on top of the low amplitude response. So in the near field, you hit the flame harder, it responds more. In the far field, it doesn't matter as much because of this nonlinear kinematic response. And I'm, by the way, I'm calling this effect kinematic restoration. This is a term, term by Norbert Peters in his book, and it just describes propagation as a flame normal to itself. He introduces this word kinematic restoration for turbulent flames, because the same thing happens. Turbulent, turbulence is always trying to wrinkle a flame. Flames are trying to smooth themselves back out, and there's this competition. Um, OK, I'm going to skip over this. I threw this slide in just for fun. Um, this, is, this is actually very recent work from our group. One of the things we're trying to understand is this kinematic restoration process in a highly turbulent flow. So this is that same oscillating body flame problem. It's a great model problem because it's so simple, because the amplitude of oscillations is constant spatially. So here we're oscillating up and down. And so actually, in a turbulent flow, you have two things going on. You have the natural kinematic restoration, which you'd have even in a laminar flame. But then you also have all these fine scale turbulent wrinkles which are also acting to smooth out your flame wrinkle. So you have an additional effect present in turbulent flows, which we're illustrating here. Um, one other effect is stretch effects. All right, I'm just, just going to blast through these here. But everything I've talked about up to this point, I said, let me assume I have a constant burning velocity. But in reality, flames are curvature sensitive. If you curve a flame, it changes its flame speed. So this is an example of a thermodiffusively stable flame. This would be a flame with a positive Markstein length. So in this flame, what happens is this part of the wrinkle that's curved in propagates faster. This part of the wrinkle propagates slower. And the wrinkle gets damped out with downstream distance. And 
positive Mark Stein length flames. This is a stretch effect. All right. It's an important effect at high frequencies. We can pretty much ignore it at low frequencies because the wavelength of wrinkling is, is so long. All right. Okay, let me jump over these. Okay. Um, last topic, which I'm going to spend three minutes on, is I, I, I hope you now have some feel for why flames are oscillating and flapping around, what controls those dynamics. What I've talked about so far is what's happening locally on the flame, all right, at each point in space and time. For the thermoacoustic instability problem, which I spent the morning talking about, what's primarily important is not what's happening at each point, but if you take the total unsteady heat release of all points of the flame and you add it up, you get the spatially integrated response. That's what really matters. So if you take everything I've just talked about and you say, now let me wrap an integral over the whole flame around that whole thing, what happens there? Um, and um, what you end up with is you can define what are called transfer functions. Transfer function, for example, would be the ratio of the unsteady heat release divided by the unsteady velocity. And basically what happens is this transfer function, the, the magnitude of it is in, and the phase of it is you can sort of think of being proportional to that parameter tau. So this wrinkle convection process that I just talked about is what drives that time delay tau. And so a, a, a reasonably good scaling for that time delay is just flame length divided by flow velocity associated with the natural flame dynamics. Okay? Um, I'll leave this for your benefit to look at tonight. But I will just tell you that if you just take those linearized solutions I just showed you, integrate them over the whole flame, you get the right answer from first principles. And it turns out that in the low Struve Hall number limit, when the flame times the flame length times the frequency divided by the flow velocity, when that's small, the in-tau model drops out naturally. And you can actually derive exact expressions for what in should be and what tau should be in terms of things like vortex convection speeds and flame angles and, and uh, flame lengths and things like that. Okay, so that's all I had. Does anyone have any questions before we break for lunch? Okay. We said that. Yeah, so there's two. So, so what are the prospects for, for dealing with instability? You can basically take two strategies. You, you can go after the driving function, which is this Rayleigh gain term. And you do that by changing the phase between pressure and pressure phases. So that's things like you, by controlling flame length or where the flame is stabilized, or things like uh, or, or any other parameter that affects these kinds of things. The other is you go after damping. So I haven't had time to talk about this, but the Rayleigh gain, you're pumping energy into the acoustic field at some rate. But there's some natural dissipated processes that are also pulling that energy that are, that are damping. And um, so by artificial, by increasing damping, you can do that. Um, well, how do you increase damping? That's really hard. It turns out that low frequency sound damping is a hard thing to do, which is why you know, if you're sitting in your apartment or something, you hear the kind of this incoherent murmur and rumble from your neighbors, and it's all the low frequency stuff, the high frequency stuff getting filtered out by your insulation. Um, so it's a real challenge. There's lots of work going on on trying to develop um, effective low frequency dampers. One way to do it is with what are called resonant devices, like Helmholtz resonators, which are frequency tuned. And they, those can work very well. The problem is, is that the natural frequency moves around. As you're changing power, you change temperature, it starts to shift that natural frequency. And so a really effective resonator has a really high Q, high, uh, very, very narrow uh, bandwidth. And so you have to start flattening out that frequency response curve. So, so wide frequency bandwidth, high effective absorbers for low frequency oscillations is a big area. Yes? Yeah, so that's, that's that. there's a whole field of active control of instability where you basically use a secondary flame is like a big speaker. You pulse the secondary um, fuel at an appropriate phase to damp out the oscillations. It's you know it's been done. It's actually been commercialized. Uh, it's been fielded. It was expensive, and there were some reliability problems, reliability questions. And so what actually happened was it was a the company that fielded it. They they had to derate their turbine, which was such an expensive proposition that it was worth it to them to spend a few million bucks to fuel the system. They developed a solution at home, they implemented it, and they took the system back off, and there's no commercial system today. 
sir. Uh, it's never possible that perhaps we can explode these uh, uh, frequencies exist. You know, do they have to be problematic? And can you just push them to say an ultrasonic range so there's no noise problem? But you know, is that necessarily going to be damaging? The okay. Conservative? So how would you push a frequency to the ultrasonic range? Remember, it's L over C. So as long as you, if you got a combustor that's got to be this long to burn out your CO, you're stuck uh, with that frequency. Gotcha. Um, yeah, it's pretty much. Maybe not ultrasonic, but you know, perhaps you know, is it really going to be that much of a problem? Well, again, so usually combustor length is controlled by CO burn out time for, for power gen application. So if you want low CO, you got to have a combustor this long, and then from there it's just take that length divided by the speed of sound, you got your frequency, and it's usually going to be, you know, for in the hundreds of hertz. Yeah, that, that's where you are. So those are the natural frequencies that, that you're given that you have to work with. And then it's just, you have to figure out whether they get excited or not. Um, yeah. Anyone else have a question? All right, thank you all.